Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is Tree People's Learn at Home program, a program that we launched uh, after coronavirus started because we really wanted to be there for our community members while they're at home and talk about different um, offerings that we have to share with you around compost and soil and water and trees and things that you can do at home. So I'm really excited to talk about today's topic, which is compost. Um, just please keep in mind that we'd love if you could keep your camera and stay on mute the whole time um, to be respectful of everyone. There is a number, 818-623-4867, if you're having technical difficulties. Um, and if you would like to communicate with us, please use the chat. We, we welcome you using the chat. We're going to have some interactive activities where you will be using the chat. Um, so if you need anything, feel free to use the chat as well, or if you have any questions. Uh, next slide. So Learn at Home with Tree People. Um, these are videos, activities, live lessons, live interviews um, to get us reading, thinking, and growing around the environment and our six different topics that we have, trees, soil, water, our community forest, waste, and plants. So each week we're releasing offerings of um, whatever the theme for the week is. We started with tree care, we went to water in LA and stormwater capture um, and pollution, and then we went into a special Earth Day week feature where we interviewed Ed Begley Jr. and um, had some Earth Day tips for folks. And this week we're doing soil and focusing in on compost. We'll have native plants next week and the week after that waste and friendly waste tips that you can use at home to reduce waste. Um, and many topics from here on out for the for the time being. And so we're excited that you can join us today and we hope that you continue joining us um, into the future. If you go to our www.treepeople.org slash learn at home, that's where you can find all the resources, the videos, the worksheets you can use with your kids at home um, and sign up for these live lessons that will be happening every week. Next slide. All right. So without further ado, let's get started. This is our first soil week and we've chosen compost as the topic. Um, I'm joined by two very special experts here at Tree People. One is compost Kenny. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Kenny? Sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kenny Derrig. I was born and raised here in Los Angeles. I, I have been doing compost work for a little over three years now and I'm excited that you all have joined us to uh, talk trash with us. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Kenny's our waste specialist, so he, he uses that talking trash <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and we've got Emmy. Hi, I'm Emmy. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for participating today. Um, my name, uh, sorry, my position with Tree People is a youth coordinator and a project coordinator for the Environment Education Program. So my job is to interact with middle and high schoolers across LA County and raise awareness about various environmental topics and do um, fun environmental projects with them. And I'm really happy that we're able to continue our virtual education experience, even though schools are closed and we're in lockdown, but I'm very grateful for technology and to be here. Thank you, Emmy. Great, and I'm Arielle, the Director of Education and Community at Tree People. I oversee our education and organizing programs um, and again, I'm excited, like Emmy, to be able to offer these virtual offerings during this time. All right, so let's yeah, get started. Awesome. Thank you, Ariel, and thank you, Emmy. And again, thanks to everybody for being here to talk about the wonderful world of compost. Um, this is going to be a very, you know, brief overview about uh, what is compost. Uh, why is it important to compost and uh, maybe how you can get started composting. Um, even today, sometime soon. And um, I like to open the conversation with, you know, this picture of worms. They play a vital, uh, they're a vital component to the uh, process of decomposition. And uh, I have be become great friends with many a worms. So uh, we're gonna start uh, this workshop with a quick, silly little quiz question, uh, if you would, please uh, uh, answer this question in the chat box and feel free to ask any questions that you've got throughout the presentation in the chat box as well. But uh, for now, out of these food items, which do you think a worm would prefer to eat? 
you think it's pickles, plums, peanuts, pears, or pineapples? Uh, feel free to just put the letter of your response in the chat box and we'll give you like 30 seconds to submit your answer. Okay, people saying pears, maybe some pineapple, pickles. I didn't eat enough lunch, so now I'm just getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Which one would you prefer to eat, Kenny? I think a pickle sounds kind of good right now, actually. <laughs> just a pickle. I still got some leftover from last year that I picked uh, last year's cucumber harvest that I pickled myself. So, wow, it's still in my fridge. In your garden? Yeah, and I've got new seedlings now that are growing for a new batch of cucumbers this year. I would love some and pickles. pickles. Sweet, I'll uh, I'll have to share. All right, so we've got some responses in. It looks like a lot of people are saying pears. A couple people saying pineapple. Pickles, again, this is all just sounding delicious to me. But um, let's see, what would a worm prefer to eat? Pears. And um, well, although they might go for all this food, a pear would probably be their first preference. And that's because pears are slightly more alkaline as opposed to the rest of these foods. Uh, pickles, plums, peanuts, and pineapples all tend to be a little more acidic on the pH scale. And although a worm prefers to, uh, likes to live in a pH neutral home with you know soil that's neutral in pH. They prefer to eat foods that are a little more alkaline. So leafy greens, pears. Um, it's actually been found that carrots are what worms prefer to eat most out of any food. But um, you know, for the sake of this silly quiz question, I had to come up with a bunch of P letter uh, words. So uh, thank you for all your responses. And yeah, if you've got any worms, maybe uh, feed them some pears. <laughs> um, and this is a picture that's really just meant to invoke some thought and um, really just create a little bit of conversation around food waste. So if you uh, wouldn't mind and just place either just one word or a few words, or even if you feel compelled to write out a, a sentence or two about this picture, what you see here, how it makes you feel, what you think created this mess that we're witnessing here and um, what you think is being done here. Just any any initial thoughts that you've got, really just trying to um, get us on this path of, of talking trash, talking waste, and talking how talking about how our food waste can actually become a another resource for us. So um, any thoughts or feelings or uh, observations are encouraged, please feel free to type them up in the chat box. Sad, yeah, definitely. A lot of wasted food. I see I see a lot of watermelons that could probably be juicy. A lot of melons in general, actually. Looks like a cantaloupe. Um, Brought right alongside food insecurity, yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. True. A lot of food going to waste while certain people aren't getting the access to food that they need, healthy food. So a lot of healthy food going to waste. How about you, Emmy? What do you think when you see this? Um, it makes me think of that um, game, Fruit Sword or Fruit Ninja. Uh, Fruit Ninja. <laughs> Obviously, that's just a game where you're like, you know, swiping fruits. But this is, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem real. You know, it seems like something you, I don't know, see in a movie or a game. But the fact that this actually happens in in real life is extremely shocking. I don't think many pe people are aware of the amount of organic waste that we get. I think people are used to seeing pictures of like plastic in the ocean, but I don't think many of us are aware of just how much like edible food ends up at, in landfills. So it's a very powerful image for sure. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for that. And, um, you know, I can't exactly specify what happened to cause all this mess in this picture, but uh, let's see, I feel these fruits and vegetables are being wasted because they will not make it to the grocery store. Um, and, and in order to sell, absolutely, yeah. So um, there are plenty of factors that can create this mess. One of them um, being the aesthetic appearance of some of these fruits and vegetables. A lot of them don't even make it to the grocery store shelves because they don't look good enough. They don't meet the certain size criteria that the supermarkets are looking for. So a lot of our food goes straight from the farm to the to the waste, to the landfill, or, or possibly to get composted as well. But a lot of our 
food waste doesn't even make it to the shelves in order to um, see the light of day. Um, even when it does make it to a grocery store, it may not get purchased. It may rot before it's bought. Um, and then otherwise, you know, we could still buy food and not use it and still create food waste in that way as well. So um, there are plenty of ways restaurants maybe be over purchasing uh, food waste needs to be recycled or reused. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, this was just meant to kind of, you know, invoke some thought and, you know, create some conversation around food waste. And um, yeah, we're, we're going to talk today about how we can avoid you know, sending something like this to a landfill, and if we're able to compost that material instead, then how how much more beneficial that will be for us as people, for our environment, and for um, other species, and for future generations as well. So, um, so thank you for adding your two cents, everybody. All right, so we're gonna start with a little history on compost. And even though historians don't exactly know the uh, or the origins of composting. Composting is actually referenced in many historic records, including clay tablets from Mesopotamia, ancient Chinese history, as well as the Greeks and Romans, and it's even referenced in the Bible. And the references um, talk about composting animal, animal manure, straws, and other plant waste, as, as well as cooked bones and human rags and things like that. So the ancient Egyptians were also very notable composters and Cleopatra actually strongly identified herself with the goddess Isis, which is an Egyptian go goddess. And she basically represents fertility, motherhood and magic. And at the time, Egypt had some of the most fertile growing soil in the entire region. And Cleopatra knew of the importance of worms um, for soil fertility and she held high regards for worms and earthworms. And in fact, she had such a high, high affinity for these worms that she created a royal decree, a law that banned the removal of earthworms from Egypt. And it was actually punishable by death. So it was a really serious crime to remove earthworms from Egypt. And so that just goes to show you know, how, how seriously um, wor earthworms were valued in Egypt, which is pretty neat. They knew the value of earthworms before, you know, before all this science that we had. Yikes. And then, in looking at more recent history, um, Charles, Dar Charles Darwin, who is a British naturalist, most known for developing his theory on evolution based on natural selection, he actually wrote an entire book dedicated to worms. And it was actually his last book that he ever wrote before he died. And it was published in 1880, 1881, called The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms. And he concluded in this book that he said, it may be doubted if there are any other animals which have played such an important role in history uh, as these lowly organized creatures. And this was a pretty controversial like uh, concept because at the time, um, you know, organisms were separated into intellectual hierarchy and humans were at the top and worms at the very bottom considered as completely like useless of no value, but Darwin knew that they were extremely important. And this book actually sold more copies than his most famous book, which is uh, On the Origin of Species. And this was apparently because English people had a healthy obsession with gardening. And they, you know, believed his, his words on the importance of worms on, on um, creating soil, for, for, fertile soil. So. Compost is uh, defined as a mixture of various decaying organic substances, such as dead leaves or food waste, used for fertilizing soil. And it's, al it's also a verb, it's a noun and a verb, so you can say to compost, um, to use in compost, to make compost. So that's just the basic definition. So why is it important to compost? Well, composting makes a big difference uh, locally as well as globally. By composting organic waste, such as our vegetables and fruits, we're diverting waste from landfills. And at the same time, we're adding microbial life and nutrients to the soil. So it's really beneficial on the small scale as well as the, uh, the bigger scale of, you know, talking about food waste and, and global food waste. And let's talk more about diverting waste from landfills. You might think that there's a little there's little difference between sending your organic waste to a landfill versus putting it in a compost bin. However, there's actually a really big difference because organic waste broken down in a landfill produces methane, which is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. And 
this happens because waste sent to landfills breaks down anaerobically, which means there's no oxygen present at the time of breaking down. And that's, you know, so that doesn't smell. And as the rubbish breaks down over time, um, it's, it's confined in space and it's, it's all capped with soil and clay. But what happens is that when this rubbish breaks down without any oxygen, it emits methane, which is 20 times more powerful and potent of a greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide, which obviously is, is a very big contributor to, to global warming. And landfills actually account for 34% of all methane emissions in the U.S. So that just gives you an idea of how, how we could minimize or reduce the impact of global warming if we reduce the amount of you know, things going into landfills. On the other hand, organic waste placed in a compost bin rots with oxygen, which you know, microbes, fungi, insects, and worms slowly decompose these things into a valuable resource that can be used in the garden. And these are just shocking um, figures. 40% of food grown in the US goes uneaten, and most of it ends up in landfills or dumps. And then 50% of waste that is sent to landfill or landfills and dumps is actually organic waste. So that's half, you know, half of our landfill waste is organic waste. If a quarter of us switch from dumping organic waste in landfill sites to composting it, we would save the equivalent of 2.5 million tons of carbon dioxide from reaching the atmosphere every year. Yeah, and um, I think now might be a good time to just kind of compare, you know, a system like a landfill compared to composting. Something like a landfill fits more into a linear system, like we would see on the left here, where we're, um, you know, really just, you know, extracting resources, but by placing them into a mountain of trash and letting them break down anaerobically, we're creating uh, impactful emissions into our atmosphere, not only up into our to our air with methane, but uh, creates a toxic liquid called leachate, which um, goes down into our underground water tables as well. So um, if we can move away from a linear type of um, waste system where we're sending waste to a landfill, and if we're able to utilize those nutrients that are still locked up in those uh, orange peels and in those garden clippings, and if we're able to compost them, it would fit more into a circular type of system on, like you see on the right, which is where you know we're recycling, repurposing, reusing uh, all of our resources. So we're not just wasting them and letting them um, harm us sitting in a landfill. So, um, Los Angeles is actually home to the biggest landfill in the U.S., um, fun fact. And the landfill is no longer operational, but it's located in Puente Hills in southeastern L.A., near Whittier. It operated from 1957 until 2013, during which it, it accepted roughly a third of L.A.'s trash. Today, the L.A., uh, sorry, the landfill is capped, and it looks like a small mountain or hill, you would never really know that it was a landfill, but um, the, the actual trash part of this landfill is roughly the, si the same size as New York Central Park. So it's huge, and I think half of it is like designated wildlife preserve, which is interesting to me. I, I don't know what kind of impact the, all the trash that's decomposing underneath um, is impacting the wildlife preserve next to it. But um, so yeah, this. Kenny and I actually visited this uh, this Punta Hills landfill. You can go and take a tour. If you're a teacher, it's a really great place to have a field trip. It's even just a great place to go as a family because you get pretty nice views. And right now it's all capped, so you can't see the trash. But there's a bus that you can take, and it tours all around the top. And there's a uh, there's a recycling facility right next to it. I believe it's a recycling facility, and you mm -hmm. can see how that waste is being processed. It's very educational. So we have a little quiz for you all. When it was open, Puente Hills landfill could accept up to how many pounds of waste per day? 24,000, 240,000, 2,400,000, 24 million, or 240 million. Yeah, feel free to submit your answer into the chat box. And remember, this landfill accepted roughly 30% of all of LA's waste. That, if that would help you guys make a guess, educated guess. All right, so we got a couple of guesses for 240,000. We got one for 2,400,000. And another one. 
We'll give you about 10 more seconds to place your vote. We got a lot of B and C. Eugene, thanks 240 million. Man, that number is hard to even fathom. I know. <laughs> All right, so how many pounds could the landfill accept per day? It's 24 million actually. I don't even, I can't even visualize how much trash that is. Like, I don't even know how to envision envision that. Yeah, same. <laughs> Horrifying. What <laughs> that in your house? Like, would that, would that fit in my house? Probably not, right? I, I highly doubt it. Yeah, no, probably a, a fraction of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Maybe if I lived in a big mansion, it would fit. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, so um, Punta Hills was open for 56 years, like I mentioned, and accepted over 142 million tons of waste. And that's, what was it, how many pounds? Uh, One ton is like 2,000 pounds. So I don't know if, if anyone can do that math out there. I would love to know what that number is. I'm not sure. An unfathomable amount. Got a name to it. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Octillion, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so all landfills produce methane. And one of the benefits, I guess, or something that, you know, the technology allows us to do is capture par a part of the methane that is released. Instead of it being releasing, it, instead of it releasing into the atmosphere, we can capture some of that methane to generate electricity. And the Punta Hills landfill generates enough electricity to power 32,000 homes, which is, you know, it's, it's a good um, way to minimize or reduce the level of methane going to the atmosphere. But there's uh, there's no way to capture all of it, and um, more energy was was required. Sorry, it doesn't offset all of the energy that went into the landfill. So even though it's you know still a good thing, it's not really offsetting the other environmental harm that's being done by by the landfill. Yeah, and what's um... Furthermore, upsetting is that we're actually running out of waste space here in our landfills in Los Angeles County. Uh, we have over 80 landfills here in the county, but um, only three remain open. You know, 80 or more are um, capped, they're full, they've reached their capacity. So we're down to the last three landfills in all of LA County, and even those are starting to reach capacity. So in the next seven years, by 2027, we're actually going to start putting all of our trash on a train and we're gonna train it over 200 miles, right past Joshua Tree National Park, right past the Salton Sea, down to the southeasternmost corner of California, just west of Arizona and just north of Mexico. And we already have space here for the landfill. It's already designated. They're already building the tracks. It's set to go. We're running out of space here. So um, it's just important to know that, you know, the waste that we are creating here in Los Angeles uh, is soon going to be impacting other communities uh, and other environments, uh, even outside of our own state, outside of our own country. So um, to me, that's a bit upsetting and just kind of makes me want to um, re-envision how I can minimize my waste so that I'm not getting, you know, so much waste put onto a train, sent 200 miles down to, you know, regions that had nothing to do with the waste that was generated and that's going to be living there. So. Just a uh, you know something to keep in mind, and again, this this kind of falls in order in line with the linear type of system of um, you know extracting, taking things, making them, using them, disposing them, but not really utilizing the the resources that are still left within those those materials. Whereas if we are to try and recycle them organically, we can try to compost them take those nutrients that are still there and uh, support future generations of growth with those uh, nutrients. So on that topic, um, the other point that Emmy had brought up earlier was that compost adds microbial life and nutrients to the soil. So right now our current agricultural system in the United States and in other countries uh, relies heavily on the use of chemicals. So pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and this strips the soil of its ability to support life because it's all synthetic. It's not 
organic material. Um, and there are estimations that we actually only have about 60 harvests left before we really deplete all of life in the soil and the nutrients needed to create these things. So since we've already depleted the soil so much here in the United States uh, through these industrial agricultural practices, we are seeing things like this, you know, like monoculture, monocropping, where it's just one huge field of one type of um, produce. And since the soil is so dead, we are using those synthetic chemicals to support the life of the plants, but it's not supporting the life of the soil. And, um, you know, maybe you garden or if you ask anybody that may garden, um, the key component to growing food is actually not feeding the plant, it's actually feeding the soil. We need to make sure we have healthy, life-giving soil, and the soil is only life-giving if it has life in it already in life itself. When it doesn't have life in it, um, we have something like this, which is a picture of a, a potash mine, or sorry, this is a phosphate mine. Um, this is where it, it's in Florida. Um, we are extracting phosphate from the earth and manipulating our environment because that phosphate is uh, will be used to create phosphorus. And phosphorus is one of the key nutrients that plants need in order to grow big and strong. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are kind of the the three major you know, uh, letters that gardeners go to when they're looking at fertilizers and stuff, it's your nitrogen, your phosphate, uh, phosphorus, and your potassium levels. So when the soil doesn't naturally have phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen in it, we have to extract it from the earth and create these synthetic fertilizers to uh, grow these plants. This is in Utah, and I know it's strikingly beautiful, but this is a, a potash mine where we extract potash minerals from these mountains and we create the potassium that these huge monocrop farms need in order to grow those plants. So um, again, if we are able to compost and recycle the food waste that has already been grown and consumed or um, you know, not consumed, but if we can still tap into those nutrients that are left in those food, uh, food waste and any organic waste, we can avoid our reliance on this system, which again, Extraction from our, our natural resources is a linear type system where, you know, one day we're going to run out of that phosphate. We're going to run out of that potash. How are we going to support our life in our, in our farms and uh, feed people if we aren't able to create the synthetic fertilizers that we've grown dependent on in this industrial agricultural system? So, um, yeah, let's jump back into the benefits of compost and, uh, you know, I think there's probably hundreds more, but these are at least some of the top top benefits for composting. Yeah, so um, like Kenny was talking about the linear and circu circular um, systems, composting is just a great example of a circular system because you are taking something that would otherwise be waste, feeding it into the system to produce a, a valuable resource that can then you know, just keep the system going. Um, and it's self-sustaining and it's it's sustainable. So yeah, composting is a great way of, it's a great example of a circular system. So one of the, bene the many benefits of compost include enhancing food nutrition. So when you're improving the health of the soil, the nutrition of the, of the food is also improved. And another benefit is it increases crop yields, which is why wouldn't you want that? You know, why, the healthier the soil, the more, the higher the yield. Compost also strengthens plant immune systems. Plants have immune systems just like we do, just like animals do, and that can be strengthened through compost, which is a fertilizer to the soil. It also increases the soil's water holding capacity. So um, that means that it's going to improve the entire, the overall watershed by increasing infiltration of water sinking into the ground and reducing runoff. It just increases the, the ability of the soil to retain water which is a sign of a healthy soil and healthy watershed. It also improves the composition of the soil, as well as optimizing the soil's ability to capture carbon from our atmosphere, which again, helps to combat global warming and climate change by sequestering carbon from our atmosphere, excessive, removing excessive carbon from our atmosphere. And again, it reduces landfill and incinerated waste and finally, it, st it stimulates plant growth by adding nutrients and microbial life to the soil. And yes, I'm sure, as Kenny said, there's many more benefits that we haven't included in there, like 
being able to touch, you know, doing composting in your house, you're able to touch, touch <clears throat> and get just be in, you know, it's fun too. It's fun and it creates a community and raises awareness. I don't know. Yeah, I was actually about to mention that too. I mean, thank you. I was gonna say, you know, I personally feel personally feel like I've benefited from composting. It just it feels good to to know that you're you know doing the right thing and um, feeding my garden the right nutrients and some healthy stuff that I've created and and helped move along. So it's also personally satisfying and beneficial to the soul. I feel like so. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I really do mean that, even though it can be stinky sometimes. Y'all should get. <laughs> um, and uh, I think a lot of people tend to forget or just ignore the fact that we have an entire ecosystem living underneath our feet. There is a soil food web, and um, the way that we support the soil food web is by adding organic matter to it, organic material. In this illustration here, it's some corn stalks, but, um, you know, it's organic material and not that synthetic fertilizer like we um, have been talking about already that we, as a country, have grown reliant upon in our industrial agricultural system. So when we add organic matter back into the ground, the first thing it's going to do is feed our primary consumers, and those are largely fungi and bacteria. The fungi tend to be attracted more towards um, the carbon inputs, so these are going to be things like mulch or sawdust or leaves, tree trimmings of any sort, anything that comes from a tree pretty much um, that goes into the compost, the fungi are going to start attacking that uh, as well as the bacteria. But the bacteria tend to be more drawn towards that, um, the green waste or the, uh, the food waste, the, the organic matter that's kind of growing from, from the ground in your gardens. Uh, it can be, you know, garden scraps, it could be food scraps, it could be, you know, clippings, lawn clippings. Uh, but once they start breaking this stuff down, they will actually be consumed by secondary consumers, uh, things like protozoa, springtails, nematodes, and mites. And once these secondary consumers uh, consume those fungi and bacteria, that's actually when those nutrients get released. So the nutrients that were still stored up in that corn stalk is um, being extracted by the bacteria and the fungi but it's not released into the soil until they themselves are consumed by these secondary consumers. But secondary consumers aren't the last leg of the chain. There's actually another level, a third level, a higher level, or tertiary consumers, whatever you wanna call it. But these would be things like earthworms, beetles, centipedes, ants, and spiders. So um, every step we make going up or down <laughs> the soil food web is another, uh, you know, set of nutrients being released into that soil. So the more we're able to feed the soil food web, the more nutrients that we can actually add back into our into our soil. And just to kind of overview this all with the description on the bottom, it says that plants stand at the beginning of the soil food web. Through photosynthesis, they are able to capture the energy of sunlight and manufacture organic molecules that supply the energy for all other organisms. And this dynamic system works best if living plants occupy the field year long so um, rotational cropping and um, cover crops things like that to help make sure that our soil is is living health healthy uh, even at times where we're not producing um, and this, this the soil food web stretches out just uh, it stretches out beyond the soil as well you know uh, as you can see here birds eat things like arthropods and um, so it's not just this the soil web expands beyond just what's beneath our feet. Um, other animals play a factor into the soil food web as well. And now we're gonna talk about like what, you know, how, how to compost, how you can compost, what, what you need to know in order to get started to compost. All right, thanks Kenny. So what goes into compost? There's a pretty simple way to remember it. And it's basically a balanced mix of browns and greens. The browns are the carbons, they're carbon rich materials and the main job of the browns is to um, be a food source for all the lovely soil dwelling organisms that will work with the microbes to break down the contents of the compost pile. And also the brown materials help to add bulk and, and increase air to filter through the pile, which is important because they, they, it needs air to decompose. So what, what are the browns? Um, they're, any, they're actually like just brown things, leaves, <laughs> wood chips and twigs, shredded straw, hay, sawdust, shredded newspaper, um, brown paper bags, just regular paper with ink works as well, right? Kenny, ink doesn't 
like make the difference. Sure. Um, yeah. There's. I mean, each each composter has their own preferences for sure. Uh, right. But this okay. is just playing it safe. <laughs> what about like magazines? Um. I tend to avoid those or any of the, the shiny, uh, waxy kind of paper, um, you know, but again, you can talk to somebody else at compost and I'm sure they'll right. tell you that they've been doing it for years yeah. and that it's all good. So um, yeah, yes. each each person has their own preferences. So this is by no means a, you know, blanket, uh, this, this, these are the only things or, or anything like that, but these are just examples of kind of the more common items. I see, cool. Totally. Zero boxes work, eggshells, which add calcium, which is a great ingredient in your compost. Composting is like baking almost. You need to have the right ingredients to get the result you want. So Absolutely. what are the green greens are materials rich in nitrogen or protein? And they're also the items that tend to heat a compost pile up because they help the microorganisms in the pile grow and multiply quick quickly. And the greens are really like your fruit scraps, your vegetable scraps, your your peels, fresh grass clippings garden waste, plants, stalks, flowers, um, stale and moldy bread, coffee grounds are great too, tea leaves. Um, so these are just examples of, of greens. And so the important part is the balance of these two elements. And it's called the carbon to nitrogen ratio, the C to N ratio. And for the best performance of a compost pile, um, you have to have the correct proportion of carbon and nitrogen. So compost scientists who really exist have determined that the fastest way to produce fertile, sweet smelling compost is to maintain a CNN ratio of 50 to 50. And I think this ratio like depends on, on your source and, and different composters, but 50, 50 seems to be a pretty good ratio. And if the ratio, if the C to N ratio is too high, like you have too, too much carbon, decomposition will slow down. Whereas if you have too, um, if your ratio is too low and you have excess greens and nitrogen, then you'll end up with a stinky pile, which you don't really want a stinky pile, especially if you're doing it in your home. So this ratio is pretty important. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Emmy. And as, as you just mentioned, you know, composting is kind of like baking or cooking and that you, you do need a good recipe. So you can see here that, you know, you have your green inputs up top, you have your brown inputs down below, and then there are a couple other factors that we'll need to add to the bin, but, um, some of them just come on their own, like the microorganisms and the macroorganisms. You know, we don't have to add anything like worms or, or bacteria, any sort of like culture or starter kit to the back, uh, to the compost batch. Um, they will just find them their way there. Uh, I think that they, they know how to, how to travel. They know what they're looking for and, and they find their own, their own way there. Um, but some things that we might need to add as well to the pile are air and water. So, um, if the pile is a little too dry, maybe it has a little too much carbon, too much of that uh, wood, woody material, it might dry out. So when we pull all the material out and we check things out, we might need to add water to it as we add the material back in. Um, I always use the, the uh, I always compare compost to um, the moisture level of like a wrung out sponge. So that's like your desirable moisture level, something that's damp, but not dripping wet. Um, but you definitely need some moisture in there to accelerate the decomposition process. And it also needs air. So, um, Emmy mentioned it, but there's, you know, aerobic composting and there's anaerobic composting. The compost we're talking about here is aerobic. So, um, you know, we need those microorganisms to keep breathing and keep thriving in the compost bin. So if they get choked out of their oxygen, uh, such as in, in an anaerobic compost bin, then uh, that's, use, that's using different bacteria altogether. But aerobic composting, we, we, we need to turn the bin, add some air, and cool it off. Because sometimes that compost bin can get up to 130, up to 150 or six, 160 degrees. So um, by giving it some air, it also helps it to cool off a little bit when it's getting too hot for those little critters in there. And uh, when we add this material to the compost, we want to do it in a uh, lasagna style you know, method. So as you can see here at the very bottom of the bin, the first layer is like sticks and, and a lot of chunky carbon. And this is basically just going to create a blanket so that uh, you know the, the very bottom of your compost bin doesn't become super sludgy and slimy and wet and, and really gross. So um, 
creating a little blanket layer on the bottom. Uh, even in this one example, they have a second layer of brown material, um, which may or may not be necessary, but I definitely recommend at least adding one layer of browns on the bottom just to, uh, just to protect that bottom layer from getting too sludgy and slimy and gross. So um, as you can see here, you wanna keep it moist, as wet as a wrung out sponge. Uh, aerate, the air helps to speed up decomposition and it should be done throughout the entire composting process. And uh, use a compost lid to, to cover up your pile. And a lid, or at least, you know, every time I add my compost, any, any greens to the compost, I always cap it off with the browns on top. And what that's going to do is insulate the moisture to stay inside the bin, as well as um, protect any odors that might be created through that rotting food waste from escaping. So if you kind of create that insulation layer on top with mulch or even something like newspaper, it um, helps to keep the moisture in and the, the odors in the bin as well. So um, uh, yeah, we're actually going to do a little bit of a um, compost uh, demo. I have like a little mini three bin system that I, I have here at home that I can quickly show you what it looks like in each stage of, stage of decomposition. and while I make my transition from inside to outside, there's a fun little uh, gibberish puzzle, I guess, that, that we're yeah. uh, doing. Yeah. Yeah. Been and just around. so you guys know, we, are re we wanna be respectful of folks' time, so let's do the demo um, pretty quickly. And we'll also, yeah. I'll also put in the chat a link to Kenny's Compost 101 video. So if anybody wants to check that out, it goes through it in a longer way. Um, but go ahead, Emmy. Oh, and this is just a game to pass the time while Kenny's getting set up to show us his um, compost. Oh, you already showed the answer. Oh, sorry. Oh, man. My we have another computer one. was being dumb. Uh, so it's um, basically I, just a gibberish sentence that um, you have to guess what the sentence is. So if you can guess what this gibberish is, um, you win. At the game. <laughs> and if you know the answer, please type in the chat box. It helps to say it out loud. Oh, we got a winner! Keep calm and compost. Yes. Keep calm and compost is, is right. Great job. Thank you for participating in that little game. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and bear with me one second as I uh, stop presenting so y'all can see this little three bin system. Can, can everybody see this uh, three bin system here? Yes, we can see it. All right, cool. So I just want to show you that, um, you know, these things are in three stages and each stage is about a month long. So as you're filling up your bin, um, you know, slowly, you're, you're still going to get some some things like onion peels. These things are going to stay pretty fresh. Um, I forgot to grab my compost as I as I was making my way out here. But this is where I would add my fresh, you know, um, carrot tops or my eggshells, anything that I'm trying to compost. Grass clippings, um, orange peels, and I'm adding that material to this bin. And again, when I'm adding that green material, covering it up with another layer of the browns of that carbon, even something like a coffee filter here. Um, again, first putting the greens in and then the browns to create that layer on top. Um, the second stage, you won't really, and this is the second month of um, the process, you won't really see too many uh, colors or too many full big chunks of your food waste anymore. It's going to start breaking down, becoming finer and finer. You will still have your carbon remain quite chunky, but um, this stuff is breaking down and uh, after about a month here in this stage where the, those temperatures are really high, we're cranking up to about 120, 130 degrees. We're pulling this material out about once a week to give it that air that it needs. So getting a shovel or a pitchfork, pulling it all out, putting it back in so it's kind of uh, cooled off. And then uh, this third bin here is where we have our finished stuff and we would take a sifter. We would take some, um, you know, metal mesh, some screen mesh, and we would kind of sift through the stuff and all the fine stuff that would trickle out of the bottom, which uh, I'm doing a poor job of it now, but the compost would just be sifted out. And that's where we get the, the material that we want to add back into the garden. And uh, it's going to have all those nutrients that are going to support
future generations of, of life in the garden and support the soil food web as well. So um, yeah, that is a quick little demo of the three bin system. And now. Great, thank you, Ken. Yes. That just provides a little bit more of a visual understanding of how that works. Um, and where did you get that um, system, Kenny? Did you build it? Did you buy it somewhere? Um, well, this is actually from uh, LA Compost. So uh, there's a local organization here, LA Compost, that I actually do part-time work for. So they uh, lent me their bin. I'm, nice. I apologize. I'm trying to get No worries, here. Kenny. Why don't you get back set up? And um, now I think we'll open it to some questions. I know Kenny has yeah. a few more slides, but if folks can take a minute to put questions in the chat box and then I will I will ask Kenny um, those questions once we get them coming in. The first My screen question, is literally black right now. <laughs> <laughs> the first question was um, how do you get in touch with Kenny? We will provide his contact information um, in the slides. Um, and I'll give it one more second. If there are any questions, put them in the chat. We'll give Kenny one one minute to get set back up. Yeah, I apologize, everybody. I, um, I was on a two screen deal here. And once I pulled out my cord for the second screen, everything kind of just decided to go no crazy. Problem, no problem. All right. Um, don't worry about the screen sharing. I'll just I'll show you the questions. OK, are you ready okay. for them? Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you do with the material that doesn't get sifted through? Keep it in the Great. Great question. So um, yeah, once you sift out the compost and that fine material comes out the bottom, that's what you want to add into the garden. But you're still going to have some chunky stuff up in your sift, uh, your sifter, which will mostly be the twigs, the uh, you know the tree matter, mostly carbon. So what I do is I just create a new uh, storage bin for those uh, to throw back into the compost next time. Uh, it just becomes a new source of carbon, a new source of browns for the next time. A lot of times these chunkier materials are going through probably numerous times, but uh, again, it's necessary to add it in there. And um, another strategy is using it for, um, for feeding worms. If you have a worm bin or know somebody that has some worms, um, that pre-finished composts, they, they actually do enjoy that. It's pretty much just like a smoothie for them because it's so blended up already. And also by capping off a worm bin with that um, carbon material, it helps the worms to stay moist and cool in their home because those are their preferences. That's how they uh, prefer to uh, to live is, is cool and moist. So by taking the chunky material and basically making it a blanket for the top of the worm bin, uh, it helps to keep them happy as well. Great. And, okay, and I've got another question here. Cool. Can set up a compost system in a shady area or does it have to be in a sunny area? Another really great question and uh, I get this a lot actually because there's the um, the idea that the sun is what gives the compost its heat and um, I apologize for not mentioning this in the in the presentation but uh, it's a little bit of a, uh, a misnomer because the heat in a compost pile actually comes from within. Uh, amazingly enough the microorganisms that are breaking down the material in there are creating that heat. So the same way that uh, when any of us in here eat food, our bodies convert that food into energy, into calories, and we burn off those calories, you know, as a source of energy. Um, these microorganisms are consuming this material, but the energy that they create comes off as a in, in, in a heat form. Uh, so the, the byproduct of their decomposition is actually the heat that we see in a compost pile. So long mm -hmm. story short, you can have it in the shade or you can have it in the sun um, and, cool. and it'll be fine either way. So, so yeah. Great. Okay, I've got another question here. You mentioned a three bin system. How many mm -hmm. kinds of systems are there? Um, I think that's in one of our slide decks. So. We'll get to that question next. I'm gonna keep going though. Um, any experience feeding compost to worms? Absolutely, yeah. The worms actually love the, the uh, finished compost. Um, <laughs> and it's like basically in little crumbs already. So it's kind of ready for them to eat and uh, they, they will devour that stuff. So absolutely. Um, you can even just give them the, you know, the chunky stuff that'll have the crumbs still kind of on there. You don't even have to feed them 
the good the good stuff the good compost mm -hmm. you want to put, save that for your soil um, but just by giving them the chunkier material they'll be able to kind of pick the finer material off of those larger crumbs another great question all right we've got more i live in an Sweet. apartment no backyard to compost is there any reason we shouldn't be putting compost in the green bins provided by the city and where does that go Fan fantastic questions i love them i love them um so it really just depends on your municipality some cities do accept food waste and some cities don't um, i'm in the city of los angeles and i actually can put my organic waste in my green bin I believe Santa Monica, you could do the same. There's many cities that you can. There's certain limitations to certain cities. A lot of them only want your garden waste. They don't want your food waste because of the odors that it might create. Um, but it really just depends on your municipality. And uh, if you do live in an apartment and are limited to your access to a green bin, uh, I would recommend either doing some research on worms and maybe uh, making them some new pets. They, they can live underneath your sink or in any sort of a closet or shady, cool area out of the way where you can feed them, you know, your, your leafy greens and your, your alkaline type foods. Uh, or uh, check out lacompost.org. They're another lo uh, local organization that sets up community compost hubs in uh, community gardens and in other types of spaces all over LA County. And the idea is to invite the community to come in, donate your food scraps, become part of the process of composting, join on volunteer days. And um, as a result of, you know, becoming part of that system, you can also take some of that compost home once it's all uh, finished and, and ready to rock and roll. <laughs> great, great, great. Okay. Um, do the worms coming from the compost interfere with a vermicomposting situation? Uh, could you repeat that one more time? Do the worms coming into the compost interrupted? Yeah, interrupt, interfere with a vermicomposting situation. Um, it shouldn't at all, no. In fact, uh, if you are vermicomposting, the chances are that other worms will find their way there and they're just going to multiply like mad. So uh, you will find many more worms in your worm bin once you uh, start. But um, there's there's no issue with having some outside worms join the party as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question. I understood you had to mix your compost. How do you keep the lasagna method with your compost when you mix it? Okay, great. Another great question. So the, uh, the lasagna method is really just for when you're adding that material into the bin and you don't really need to pull that material out until your bin is full. So um, you just want to keep layering that stuff in over time. It may take a week, it may take a month, or it may even take a two or three months, depending on how much input you're adding to the bin. Um, but once you fill that bin up, that's what's gonna, uh, That's when it's going to start reaching those high temperatures. And that's when you're going to want to start turning it and aerating it. And by the time it's gotten to that level of a full bin, um, everything is pretty much going to be a scramble anyway. And there's going to really be no way to, to distinguish greens from browns or to separate those things. So what we do is we pull all the material out, we put it back in add any water if we need to, but um, otherwise it becomes a big scramble at that point. We kind of forget about the lasagna um, method at that point. That's m mostly just for when we're adding our material to the compost bin. So having the greens and then covering it up with the browns. Um, again, once it's filled up and it's cooking and it's really decomposing, there's no way to kind of uh, to separate or distinguish those materials. <laughs> got it, got it. All right, another question. Lots of questions today, love Yay. it guys. I'm coming. Um, what about pathogens? Is 131 really a magic number? Another fantastic question. So um, yes, for those of you who are not aware, there is a, a process for reducing pathogens, which um, is pretty much keeping your compost at 131 degrees or more for uh, a consecutive 15 days, so 15 days in a row, and you want to turn the pile at least five times to make sure that you are following this process for reducing pathogens and yeah actually it has been you know proven to reduce those um harmful pathogens that might make their way into a compost bin but um really w the source of those pathogens will really come from uh meats and manures uh, animal products so by placing those types of items in your compost you run a higher risk of introducing pathogens but when we're keeping our inputs to, uh, you know, 
basically a vegetarian diet of just like produce and uh, and maybe some eggshells and some coffee grounds and and tree matter, then we don't really run the risk of having too many pathogens, but we still like to follow that process for reducing pathogens. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that 131, uh, 131 degrees Fahrenheit is that magic number you want to hit. And you want your temperatures to kind of get up in that range anyway, because it'll kill out any um, seeds, any like weed seeds or, uh, you know, seeds that may exist in your compost. Tomato seeds are the one that kind of are the peskiest and you have to get a compost pile up to like 160 degrees in order to like deactivate a, a tomato seed. So um, anyway, side note, but yeah. <laughs> okay, a couple more questions. Any yeah. recommendations for what to do with food scraps in the kitchen before taking them out to the bin to minimize smell, flies, etc.? <laughs> I love these questions. Y'all are killing it. And by the way, I'm not, I have no idea what y'all are seeing because my screen is completely black right now. We see you. We see okay. you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry <Okay>. about that. <laughs> cool. Um, at least you're seeing something because I'm not seeing anything. Um, <laughs> great question. And my number one tip for that is to store your food waste in a freezer if you have room. Um, this is the best way that we can store our food waste. Say if you can only make it to the compost bin once a week or every two or three weeks. If you have space in your freezer, you know, find a leftover Tupperware box or a, a bag that you can um, place in your freezer and this is going to do two things first and foremost it's going to prevent the decomposition from happening and which will prevent any odors from stinking up your kitchen um, you know that can turn somebody off to composting real quick if a, a bunch of fruit flies and stinkiness are just taking over the kitchen um, but by placing it in the freezer you're going to help eliminate those odors because it's not decomposing um, but then uh, additionally once that uh, you know, material thaws out the, if you imagine like a, a frozen strawberry and if you let it sit out and kind of thaw out, the, it turns into a mushy strawberry, right? It gets all oozy and goozy. Um, that's because when a, you know, when produce freezes and thaws, it actually breaks down the cell walls. So um, by freezing your scraps is going to help you by eliminating odors, but it's also going to help the compost by, by thawing out in the pile and, and it's really just breaking down those cell walls and helping with the first step of the process already. So um, right. super helpful. And benefits. I, I put my scraps in the freezer and then I take it to our office, which is a compost hub. So you don't only have to, you know, I live in a small apartment as well where I, I can't access um, a backyard or anything like that. But these compost hubs are very helpful to where you can still compost and take your scraps. Um, so we had another question. Um, PUSD will not allow finished compost put into a school garden. Um, any particular document or source that could overcome their concern? And what I'll say to that is um, we'll give you Kenny's email because his main job is working with teachers, um, answering and helping with questions like this. So um, we'll give you his email so that you can contact him and he can help you out with that. Absolutely. And I'd be happy to, you know, when when school is back in session, make a trip out to your school and maybe even have that conversation with your your plant manager or your district supervisor in order to uh, maybe sway them in their other in the other direction. So um, I'm trying yeah. to be instantly, instantly convinced with with uh, compost Kenny's charm. Yes. Are there <laughs> any other questions? Um, those were all really great. We really appreciate them. I'm gonna share um, our presentation and finish up here. So. Oh, thank you. I. Are you, yeah, you're not no double problem. hearing me, are you? So we, I, I think we're we're really grateful, Kenny and Emmy, for your presentation. Thank you so much, um, and we're really grateful to all of you who joined us today. Um, please send us pictures and our videos of your compost activities at treepeople underscore org um, for our Instagram and our Twitter. And if you have any questions, we have our learn at home with tree people at treepeople.org email, and I can funnel you to the right person for those questions. And again, we have um, a bunch of new videos, activities, resources, live lessons coming up. Next week is actually teaching folks how to plant native plants in gardens. So if you're interested in that, sign up for our live lesson on Thursday, next Thursday with Chris and Emmy. Um, 
So without further ado, I'd just like to thank all of you for joining us. And um, I hope that you have a good rest of your day.